Morning, all. It's uh, good to be here on Sunday morning. Um, let's just pray before we get started. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here to, uh, this morning, another Sunday, Lord, where we, we can gather together in fellowship. Lord, we just pray that we would uh, find encouragement in what's shared here today. Um, we know that unless the Lord builds their house, Lord, the laborers uh, labor in vain. So we just ask that you would guide us in, in all these things. You are the true interpreter and teacher of Scripture, Lord. We, we just ask that you'd be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, first things first, you're probably wondering where my hair went. <laughs> I um, thought it was a requirement to be up here. Just a little joke. Okay. All right, if, um, if everyone could just turn with me to, to Joshua 7, um, and uh, we'll start our reading in verse 1 to 12. <clears throat> All right. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy on the region. So men, so men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men, of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring us, bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? And we'll stop there. Now, Joshua is a book of um, the successes, of, of successes, following the recount of, of the Lord's faithfulness in, in bringing his people into the land. Um, but we can tell from this first verse that, that something isn't quite right. Um, it says that the Israelites were unfaithful. Achan, son of Carmi, sinned, and the Lord's anger burned against Israel. But if we read the previous chapter, we know that Israel had just come from the mountaintops of, of victory in, in, in conquering Jericho, but quickly faced with despair when they're defeated at Ai. And the positive end to chapter 6 is quickly shattered by the sin of one man, one soldier, Achan, in chapter 7. Uh, reading on in verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of what some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have made they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever is amongst you. Whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Now here we see Joshua throws himself uh, on on the floor and 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 is um, asking pretty much asking the Lord why um, why did you bring us here um, why give us the victory in Jericho when when we've only just been led here to to be um, overrun by what was meant to be an easy walkover so an easy uh, victory for them and the Lord replies there's sin in the camp um, they've broken the covenant that that God has had um, established with His people. Um, here we see that the consequences, the corporate con consequences of one man's actions and the devastating effects that it had on the nation of Israel. 
And the more and more we read into this chapter, we sort of get an idea of how serious God takes sin um, and how serious he takes his covenant. Um, so the Lord commands his people to be assembled tribe by tribe, clan by clan, family by family, man by man, um, until the person responsible is selected. And if you know the story, um, Achan, a soldier, who covered what was meant to be set apart um, from Jericho, is, is selected and um, he's stolen uh, gold and silver and some cloak and a cloak that he, that he had coveted. Um, and he's violated the, the covenant that um, God had established with his people. Reading on in verse 24, Then Joshua together with all Israel took Achan son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons, his daughters, his cattle, donkey, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Acre. Joshua said, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all of Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan, they heaped a large pile of rocks, which remained to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the valley of Acre ever since. So no, not only did Israel suffer as a nation, um, as a result of, of, of the sin of one man. Um, in fact, 36 men died, 36 soldiers died. Uh, they were chased from the, from the city gates to, to, the, to the quarries um, and they were slain on the, on the slopes. But um, also Achan's family, his daughters, everything he belonged was destroyed. And now, some may ask, is it, is it unfair that God would blame a whole nation for the sins of one soldier? On some rare occasions, we do see God um, dealing with an individual, but on the widespread throughout the Old Testament, members or, or groups or communities are dealt with or blessed and judged together. Now, in order for us to understand why, jo why God judges an entity of people as a whole, we need to understand um, the unity or oneness of his covenants. And a covenant is a, is a binding agreement, a, a pledge or a vow. In ancient times, um, it would enable people to sustain a, a, an agreement or, or a genuine relationship. Uh, members would stipulate the conditions, the consequences of breaking an agreement. Um, here's what you can trust me for, and here's what I can trust you for. And as the two people enter into a relationship, something new is formed. Um, they would often walk through a cutting, uh, which was at the time referred to as the cutting of a co covenant, where you would cut an animal in half and walk in between as to say, should I go back on my agreement or should I breach the, the agreement of, of this covenant? Let me be as these animals here. So pretty much putting your livelihood on the line, your integrity on the line. And after so, they would, they would uh, share a meal and they would call on God um, to keep them accountable. Uh, after sharing a meal, sometimes they would exchange garments or, or tribal robes. And in doing so, they exchange identity and, cre and create a new reality. Where we're saying our destiny is now intertwined with your destiny. Um, my actions from here, um, from here on now affect uh, your destiny. And as a nation, the people of Israel are bound together as God's people. They have come together in agreement with the Lord, um, finding identity in him, in hopes of creating something new or being set apart as God's holy people. Because Israel was one people in the Lord and not just an assorted collection of tribes, clans, families, and individuals, God dwelt in the midst of their camp. God walked about their camp and therefore their camp was meant to be kept holy and any defilement would affect their relationship with the Lord and their relationship with one another. Uh, reading in Exodus 19, verse 5 to 7. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandments, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although, uh, although the earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went and summoned the, summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Now here we see 
God laying down the foundation of, of, of his covenant with his people. And as the people said, they all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. Now, there is an aspect of our culture and how we interpret the world today that stands in contradiction of what we know about covenant. As long as we're not aware or critique this cultural belief, we can never truly understand the wholeness of God's covenant. And it's something we generally, generally never realize because we've become so used to it. And it's this whole idea of individualism. Um, now, I can't say all aspects of individualism are bad, but it seems to contradict the word of God in certain areas, specifically when we understand the fullness of the Lord's covenant. We often wear a lens of individualism that causes us to define things individually. In a culture that's built on individual freedom, good is defined as what is good for the individual, right is defined as what is right for the individual, and freedom is defined as what is defined as freedom for the individual. And these are just some of the ways that we screen things and color the way we define our relationship with God. Now, according to individualistic thinking, how can God allow a nation to suffer at the consequences of one man's actions? And that's just, that's just how we see uh, things based on the society, the society we live in today, uh, on, on the culture. Uh, where everything is about us and it doesn't, doesn't make sense for one person to, to for, for a whole nation to be um, punished for the actions of one man. But because in fact God's covenant people, Israel is God, uh, God's covenant people, there is now a reality to the wholeness of the people of Israel that is more than just the individuals that make up the nation. A solidarity as a people under the covenant of God. The terminology used here is, is significant in verse 1 of Joshua 7. The phrase used to describe Israel's unfaithfulness is the term to describe a wife's adultery in Numbers 5, verse 12 to 13. It refers to the betrayal of trust that existed between two parties, namely God and man. Now, in the same way, we can understand the fall of Adam and ultimately the fall of mankind. In Adam, we all fell. When he fell, we all fell. And now if everyone could, could turn to Romans 5 um, with me, please. Reading in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Now, what does Adam have to do? What, did, what does something Adam did thousands of years ago have to do with 21st century Australian me? Why is it that by the disobedience of one, everyone after is liable? Unless, in fact, there's a wholeness to the human race as God's creation. Unless, in fact, there's a reality to the whole that is more than just individuals. And because like Achan, out of disobedience, Adam took what was set apart for the Lord. And in doing so, he separated us from God. If we read again in Joshua 7, reading halfway through verse 12. They have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted for destruction. And for us, this is sin that's amongst us, that is devoted to destruction. Adam ate from the tree, and we've been eating from the tree ever since. So what does this mean for me and you? Romans 5, verse 12 to 21, illustrates this idea, that Adam was chosen to represent his descendants. So when he fell, we all fell. The good news is, Jesus, as the second Adam, represents his people. And in his perfect obedience to God enables those of us who trust in Christ to be counted as also having kept the law. Reading in verse 18 of Romans 5, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also 
One righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Now we're starting to see a link between God's covenant and solidarity. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. The church is also called the bride of Christ. Now how is it that billions of people over time can constitute one bride? If we think in individualistic terms, we can't capture the reality of God's covenants, of the body of Christ. Until we rid ourselves of individualism, or this individualistic view that questions how one man can sin and everyone else is liable, I don't think we can really understand how one man's perfect life and his perfect death can save everyone. Christ is called the head of the church. And the church is called the temple of God in Ephesians 2, verse 21. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. There's one temple, one bride, one body, one head. And these are all different ways of expressing the same reality. And the, rea the reality is, is that we are all bound together as new creations because of our co common covenant in the Lord. Now, the dangers of in individualism is that it rational sometimes rationalizes sin as I'm only hurting myself. Emphas emphasizing the ind individual is dangerous, as Paul says, as we are not to abuse God's grace. But there's truth to individualism. Scripture definitely teaches that there's individual responsibility. We will all ultimately stand before God and give an individual account. But when overemphasized, it becomes a problem when we don't identify as a faith community or a church. If we're looking at things from God's perspective and not from our own individual perspective, we see that the church is more than just me and Jesus. If we keep this worldview, there's no reality of the bride, no reality of the temple. It's just me and a Jesus kind of thing. And what happens is there's no loyalty, no commitment, no discipleship, no reality of the union of, of the church. Jesus said that people will know he is true by the body of Christ, by the unity of the body of Christ. When we replicate who God is in our midst with one another, a reflection of his covenantal love, then the world will see that there is a head. Why? Because there's a body. I found this in the article and I thought it was appropriate to tie everything together. Israel's covenant with God was foundational not only to its religion, but also to its self-understanding. Israel's existence as a nation derived from the covenant between God and his people. Israel was a covenant community. It was Israel as a corporate body that became a kingdom of priests in Exodus 19, not a subset of individual Israelites. As a holy nation, Israel was to reflect God's character because God dwelt within Israel's midst. And it's amazing to me that not only are we too a corporate body saved by the death of Christ under a new covenant and chosen to reflect God's character, but the spirit of God is to dwell in us. And like the Israelites were, were called to, to reflect God's character. But through the, unfaithfulness, through the unfaithfulness of Achan, the fall of Adam, the Israelites, corporate body, and, and, and the church as a singular body, over thousands of years, God's character is consistent regarding covenantal agreement. And there's always an emphasis of solidarity and an emphasis on the collective as a whole. Ultimately, the, the unifying character of God's covenant is a reflection of his true triune nature eternally existing in harmony, three in one. That man was created in solidarity to reflect the fullness of God's triune love. And in our obedience to God, we reflect the unity of God's character. Father, we thank you for today and, and the opportunity to share the word, Lord. We just 
ask that you would allow this to, 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 to resonate with people, Lord, with us here today, that your teaching um, would, would uh, minister, Lord. Uh, just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.